All right, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Ramble Blog. Today, we're going to be talking about threat, threat generation, and how to apply it in your games. Uh, primarily, how to best use it to try to dictate how your opponent plays their game, which therefore allows you to continue playing yours and not let it be used in such a way where you are being dictated how you can play your game. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to the C's, the initiative episode, as well as a bunch of other concepts we've been talking about. So, But this is one of the more important ones that I think people... Uh, sometimes struggle with, at least in conceptualizing. So here we have two different lists. One of these is intentionally a skew list that's designed around speed because it's a very uh, threat-heavy list. The other of which is a much more all-comery uh, kind of style list, though it does have three dragons, which is pretty noti uh, notable. Uh, so in this case, what we're going to be talking about is how threat is generated, what threat does, and how to calculate how much threat a unit is putting out. And also just understanding why certain units are actually more threatening than at first perceived, I think, for a lot of people. So, threat is basically the ability for a unit to project itself onto the board using controlled space. So, what that actually means in terms of functionality is if we look at any unit, let's say a unit of RevCab, a unit of RevCab has a charge range of 16 inches, that means up to the 16 inch line, it is projecting its ability to put out the 16 attacks on fours with Thunderous 2. Any unit that comes within that area is under threat of being attacked by the RevCav, being charged by the RevCav. This would be melee threat. The same is true of shooting units, though it gets a little trickier as shooting units tend to not have to move, but still technically have a threat range It just tends to be much further out than uh, cav or even flying monsters and in uh, response tends to do less damage so the units that have longer reach tend to not have as much output just by default and you'll see this across the board there are very few units that have high speed and a high output uh, the noticeable exceptions being hordes of knights which you pay almost 400 points for uh, or there's some degrees of speed 7, maybe speed 6 heavy cavalry that would fall into that category. Things like Honor Guard are pretty close, but they're still not going to be faster than speed 8 a lot of the times in the most extreme circumstances. Uh, the fastest, most threatening thing in the game is probably a horde of Dracon Riders, just due to its decent output and high threat. It should be able to average about 10 wounds when it does a charge, so that's going to be one of the hardest hitting units in the game for projecting threat, uh, which elves are exceptionally good at. Um, the reason this matters is because, especially when you have multiple units that are projecting these radiuses of threat, that basically limits how your opponent has to approach it. They have to try to limit how many units can connect with one of their units at a given time. This is similar to trading pieces in chess. You want to try... You, the goal of kings should always be to trade pieces. It's okay to lose something if you take something of your opponent's that's worth more. And that way you can dictate, again, that you are ahead in the game. As long as you're one piece up, you're doing okay. And so the best way to illustrate this is unfortunately just to play a game. So we're going to do a really quick rundown of the first couple turns of a game. In this case, rolling for top player and rolling for bottom player. So top player gets first turn. I would argue that this role is in fact the single most important role of the game. I think it's more important than turn 6 to turn 7, respectively. And I think a lot of that has to do with how much board control turn 1 gives a person. I think even slower armies still want first turn, because it allows them to take position on the board and gain some sort of control over the center of the board and the ability to use that to then further their game plan. So in this case, turn one for this top table army, we're going to see very quickly how much this affects the bottom player, is going to look like these two dragons moving into this terrain. They don't have to move the entire way. They want to stop just outside of uh, some conceivable things like a Shobek Surge uh, and a Pappy and a Revkev with Pathfinder getting through, because that would probably be a little bit too much for them. So they stop just a little bit shy of uh, it's 14 inches, so they want to be here, respectively. Yes. And then 
everything else can advance pretty swiftly because they just have a lot of room to play with. Uh, if anything, again, they can stay outside of a safe 14 inches here, and that's totally acceptable. These guys can take up position on the hill, which gives them a very nice battery position, shooting battery. And since they're flying, they can keep this formation fairly easily. These Reapers actually, if anything, want to pivot and turn to make sure that they're at least 50% on the hill. They're probably not going to be able to fit there uh, with a little bit of finagling. Uh, could have been done, but not going to worry too much of it for just a quick demo episode of what threat looks like, and especially first turn threat. Uh, over here, the Regiment of Chariots is significantly less threatening. We can even be as cautious as staying out of charge range of it just to be really on the nose with knowing how much we have to worry. These chariots were deployed sideways, sideways intentionally to give them a little bit of a speed boost on their first turn, so they're not projecting threat right now. But it is important to note they will fairly soon. If anything, I would actually risk bumping these all the way up to the wall and risk getting charged by the chariots because the chariots are not going to pop this in one turn anyway. And this just shows you that this chariot unit is not projecting enough threat to actually prevent things from coming into its bubble, or at least not on its own. Uh, and then these Reapers will advance as quickly as they wish. And this guy... In this case, this is the risk of deploying like this, is now this dragon gets a free movement that takes him much closer and does not have to worry about getting charged initially. So we see something like this. And as long as he's outside a line of sight of this chariot, which he should be, he is completely free to do this. Now in this case, the reason that I probably wouldn't do this is he still risks getting ground by the chariot. So in this case, probably doesn't go all the way forward. Or just says, risk it anyway, and let's see, where would he want to position? If he does this, this is actually still okay, because you're looking at the chariots getting flanked, and then he can just pivot and book in a direction, basically. So I actually think this is still a safe play for him. It's definitely a very aggressive play, but that makes sense. Um, in any case, this first turn movement, as we can see across the board done very quickly just for illustration purposes, notice how much further all these bubbles now are. Now these dragons, for starters, are in charge range of almost half of the army. All of them are. In some way, shape, or form. And the stuff that doesn't have a direct charge next turn has now projected its threat at least 10 inches out from where it is now, and it's across the center of the table. If we were playing loot, this army now has a much stronger chance of claiming the loot tokens that should be approximately right here and hauling them back behind them. If this were Dominate, it's going to be much harder for this army to come in and start trying to secure the Dominate zone because it now has to come into this army's threat and projection. If this were Control, this army can't move very far before it's getting more charges from all these other elements of this army, so it becomes much riskier for this army to advance. This is just how powerful first turn threat is. In chess, this would be the equivalent of getting to move every single one of your pawns forward on the first turn and set them up in positions where they can counter anything that tries to take a pawn. It is crazy how much control you can get out of this opening move. It's obviously always going to be a bit stronger on an army that has the speed to project its threat further out, but even slower armies that are infantry focused still want to get this board control because if anything else, it helps limit how far this other army could come up to there for deny them access to the board. So now this army has to deal with this movement. Shooting threat gets interesting because shooting threat behaves in different ways. Um, due to the awkwardness of King's Hills, these guys effectively don't draw direct lines through the hill, they draw kind of an arc over this hill directly in front of them. So by sitting on this hill, this unit, this battery now has access to basically everything uh, in this radius. Obviously, arcs have to be uh, believed here, but this, this area has just been turned into a shooting zone. 
and there isn't a whole lot of cover here outside of these fields. This hill will not provide cover because these guys are on the hill. Um, actually, I'd have to check and see if another hill provides cover. That one may actually still provide cover. But even if that's the case, it's a very limited degree of cover that not the entire army is going to be able to fit between, basically. So you would still have this entire arc here of uncovered space, this entire arc here of uncovered space, unless units are completely within the field. So the shooting threat and pressure puts pressure on the player to move forward, because otherwise this will just keep happening over and over and over. In a perfect scenario, you could move forward and take advantage of the areas where these shooting units cannot project as much threat at the bare minimum. So in this case, behind this hill, or at least majority off the hill to try to get cover of it, assuming that that actually works that way. Again, I'll have to triple check on that. But if that weren't the case, then at that point, you just have to advance. If this is all one giant area of no cover, you don't really get a choice. Um, the, the downside of shooting threat is that in a lot of situations, shooting is so efficient at projecting threat that it basically you just have to ignore it um, and power through it. There are a lot of cases where I see players who will stall and think that they can either out heal shooting or that they can out position shooting and then the shooting just starts picking up their pieces and now they're in a deficit and then they start losing. Um, and that's, that's, in fact, exactly what shooting wants to do. And a good, balanced army will have a combination of shooting threat, so shooting that puts pressure on you to move forward, while also having units that are fast, whether or not those are dragons, knights, or some other form of cav. And these cav units now projecting threat basically say, if you want to come get the shooters, you have to come within range of the cav. And then you can have either a mixed arms list with plenty of infantry to back that up, or you can have a skew list, which is just all cav, so that you, you know, it makes it exceptionally difficult to get within range of the shooters. So we're going to try to see how I could best counteract this threat. The short answer is it's not going to be great. Um, this dragon in particular is exceptionally threatening and there's not a lot of ways to deal with him right now. The best options here, this cab is just out of range, and you'll see this becomes a common problem with this uh, situation is that there just isn't a lot of places to move that aren't going to be covered by something. The best possible option for this player here is to risk the charge of the chariots onto this dragon because the dragon has to be grounded, which will limit its threat on this side of the board. Now that's still risky, and it probably is going to sacrifice this chariot unit in the place, but gaining back board control over here is going to end up being more important because otherwise this player will stall out and get stuck here, and at that point, this stranglehold will only get worse as the game gets goes on, because these shooting elements will batter down the rev cab slowly but surely. And if anything, we can do that first round of shooting here. So we're looking at, just to exemplify the point, it doesn't even have to be a lot of damage, it just has to be damage because over time it will slowly start chipping away at this list, even with elements like Shobek to heal it back up. So we would have 18 lightning bolt shots against the Revenant Cav Troop. We'll call them on fives, just because we'll assume the hill does grant cover in this case. Actually, no, it should not grant cover because they are taller than it, so... Uh, looking at three wounds. That won't kill them, but it does start putting damage on them and forcing them to think about their options. Two extra? Yeah, no, only one extra hit there. Ah, but I didn't roll enough dice is what happened. So there are actually two extra. There we go. Four damage. Much more believable. So they would have had five, there is actually a chance for them to be broken. They would have been just fine, so they would have gone down to four. But in any case, this starts putting pressure because over time, this is not going to sustain by the time these guys start picking stuff up. So this needs to happen initially. This needs to now... A lot of things basically have to start being risked on whether or not this can be 
disordered, which is why this is such a strong opening move. Um, the best option for our chariot here is to basically sideways shuffle, and then specifically shuffle in such a way that the shortest path will now be to the butt. And then we're praying that either these guys don't block, or that this does not pick them up. And the easiest way to do that is going to be to intentionally march this chariot up as fast as possible. Uh, if anything, we want to try and maneuver this chariot in such a way that... These guys just can't get to the butt. If possible, we want to stay out of the reach of these Reapers. Now, I don't think in this case this will work the way we would like it to. Um, it's still going to get the Pharaoh double charged. And due to the way this is positioned, because this is actually the most optimal positioning by this player, these Reapers are slightly to the left, so they will slide to this side, therefore avoiding this fence when this happens. So these guys will slide to the right. Um, I don't think there's any other way to prevent that other than if the Pharaoh goes straight forward like this and stops an inch away. This might end up working in the Pharaoh's favor, and the reason for this is, given the same logic, this unit now has to bump up against the building, potentially. It's still very risky because there is a dragon here. If this dragon is not grounded, this dragon will eat this Pharaoh. Um, so it becomes a very risky play, but that helps condense the threat of this dragon and limits it, which is the other reason you have to play super passively with dragons and other nimble elements so they don't get caught out because now this is going to be separated, isolated, and removed, and the rest of the army may not be able to catch up to it. Uh, have a small potential for another double charge here, but that's uh, going to be iffy. Um, and then on the flip side of this, again, as we said, the shooting element, there's just not enough cover here to cover the amount of damage that will be coming in, so the army just has to advance. Now you want to limit how much stuff can hit it at one time. So these butchers are going to be the biggest threat, backed up by these reaper troops. Realistically, we don't care about the scarecrows, and if they do get into combat, great. We just want to make sure to limit what their options are when they do. So the best thing to do is we do have this chaff piece here intentionally, and that is to help limit what can charge us to reduce the threat or the impact of units. So we can throw that one up pretty aggressively. And then after having thrown that one up, this Reaper troop can't see through the forest, which means this Reaper troop basically doesn't project threat right now, or at least doesn't project threat this turn. So we can advance up fairly safely. We still have to be aware that a double charge from both of these and possibly with assistance from the horde of scarecrows might be enough to take out this uh, regiment. So we give Shobek up there with some backup. And we can now pivot this unit like so. And what this does is because of the frontage provided, even if this scarecrow horde declares a charge here, both of these will not be able to fit at the same time. So we've reduced the threat of incoming charges by reducing how many elements can fit here. Double dragon charge to the front is still gonna be very painful, but it's not gonna be a guaranteed break. So there's a high chance for whiffage. Uh, there's reasons why this unit may just, uh, it, basically nothing wants to get stuck right next to Shark. Um, it's never a good time. Uh, Shobek just has to be careful to make sure that neither of these are in his flank. So and that's easily achieved just by maintaining the distance. And then a Pappy basically has to do the same thing. Now a Pappy, this gets tricky because a Pappy does not want to have this guy touching his flank either. So a Pappy needs to back up and pivot slightly. It doesn't have to be a huge pivot. As we can see, just by pivoting a small amount, we can keep him in the front. 
And this allows him to not be charged by either of these elements, leaving him free to keep projecting his threat. This is one of the best ways to play dragons, in my opinion, is to not actually run them on flanks, but run them in the center of your list, where they can project threat in all directions. And more importantly, this threat can't be stopped because you have elements in front of them preventing charges. So in this situation, a Pappy effectively cannot be turned off. A Pappy is always going to be an active threat on this board, unlike these two dragons, which one of them has been reduced on these units. So, and if this troop gets picked up, all of these elements that will be needed to remove this troop will now be stuck in a position where they are basically going to get sandwiched and die. Um, so at this point, we can now safely move these rev cab up. We again want to stay just out of the range of the butchers, but we can move up pretty far. And now we can put these elements into the threat. These chariots are effectively chaff in this game. Uh, they don't get a lot of great options here with the Reapers on this hill very easily capable of uh, murdering them. But they can try and shoot them off. If anything, we'd probably want to be a little bit more cautious than that. We can prevent just giving up the chariots by putting them right here. There we go. And this way they can shoot the Reapers and potentially pick them up early. The Rev Cab can do the same thing and position in such a way that now we've effectively reversed the effect of the threat. So what had been a position where these dragons were now causing our entire army to be sandwiched and not being able to come into it, we've now basically limited how much damage these dragons can do. Oh, I might not have. Hold on. Uh, Pappy right there. See, and this is the trick with dragons. Is you got to be careful. Because in this case, this one's looking like it's going to flip back here and hit the butt. So this red cab unit actually needs to back up slightly. This one might have difficulty seeing it. It definitely has arc. But we do have an Apappy to use to block line of sight. In this case, though, that's not going to end up working. So what we actually want to have happen is for this rev cap to turn like this. Now, in this case, there's still a potential for two dragons to sneak in and get through here, but with Surge being such an active element of VOD strategy, it's very possible that Shobek can turn and pincushion them, assuming they do want to try to take this charge. Um, and we can back that up by also having the uh, the monument moved forward 5.7, so we can't effectively pivot that. Um, but we can have a Pappy move oh so little over to the left, and that effectively allows him to prevent these guys getting multi-charged, ideally. There we go. That should do it. So all this now is showing just how difficult it is for this army now to now come into this one. We've effectively reversed the effect of the threat. Now this is a skew list, so admittedly it is good at doing that. But this list is now going to have a very difficult time charging into everything without losing pieces. It might be able to pick up a single piece here, probably the RevCab troop, possibly this RevCab regiment, but it's not going to be able to pick up anything else in one turn realistically. And because of that, all these other elements are going to be able to sandwich in on whatever pieces go for these units and start deleting them. In fact, it's almost ideal for this list to actually back up a little bit and accept the fact that charging into here is probably a bad idea. With that, that would buy them another turn of attempting to get some shots off. They might be able to pick up this troops without having to trade pieces. They could risk flying a dragon over therefore getting them some more board control again, and there's always the chance that this dragon does get wavered. The best option for this dragon, for the record, assuming it doesn't get really randomly killed by the chariots, would be to back up, pivot, and walk 10 inches. And as long, well, I say that, as long as it's able to get outside of the pharaoh's arc, the correct option is to pivot and walk 10 inches in a direction. Uh, may not be able to escape. Yeah, there we go. So this dragon would effectively be able to escape, therefore leaving both these units staring off into space, wondering what to do for a turn. 
And over time, we would see this dragon come this way, move over here, pivot up, and then start flanking these units, which also leads to it is better for this army to back up and give these units time to do that maneuvering. Um, if anything, if they want to commit somewhere, they could throw the chaff here to start stalling up this pharaoh. So, or another possibility is just to back it up. They could shift it sideways and move the reapers over to the left to give some more options. You do have to be cautious in situations like this because pharaohs have really narrow lines that they can sneak through. So let's say that the Night Stalker player decides to just hold their ground. So they back up the bare minimum, but they hold their ground on the left and basically dare the player to come through here. There are some dirty tricks that you can play with pharaohs where because we started in the flank of this void lurker, if we move like so, and then like so, we will clip the back corner before anything else. It's not perfect, but I do have a little bit more room to pull this off with. There we go. So we clip the back corner, and then the pharaoh then aligns here, assuming there's enough room. So you have to be really careful. So this, this piece is just in the right spot to prevent it. But you could do something like this and suddenly have a piece in the back line. Um, the aptly named princess maneuver. So, and that's just because because the pharaoh's base is longer than it is wide, it allows him to effectively pop out on the far side of a unit rather than stop halfway in the middle like a 50 millimeter base would. Um, and that can catch people off guard where suddenly now they're having to turn units around to deal with the unit in their back line instead of just turning to face where he is in the side. Because the follow-up to that turn is a whole bunch of other options, assuming this dragon doesn't just die. Uh, the the final piece to this puzzle is Surge, um, and it is worth taking a moment to talk about what Surge is actually good for, in my opinion. Um, I could do a whole episode on Surge as a concept in its own. There are a lot of things you can do with it, so this is not... I, I don't want to generalize too much and say it's the only thing Surge is good for, but... There are basically three uses for Surge. One is you can use it to perform very tight one-inch maneuvers that guarantee you a flank. So in this situation, a good surge, in my opinion, would be pivoting here, moving eight inches, as long as you can limit it to contacting this unit first. Uh, we would have to stop here, and then we would surge to connect with the flank here, and as long as this is in the side, which in this case it isn't, so this one actually won't work out the way we want to. And this is what you often find with surges, is that you don't actually end up getting as many good ones as you would like. Um, with that being said, this one's going to be too tight of a corner, or should be too tight of a corner with good positioning. Uh, you might be able to come eight inches forward here and get a weird enough pivot, but you'll notice that it's going to end up connecting with the front. You won't be able to get enough of a majority over the edge of the flank to get there. And these are with fast units that have a lot more options for this type of maneuver. Um, but that's the main use in theory of Surge, is you do something like this, pivot, walk, and then Surge. And now you have a one inch Surge into the butt of something and it's very powerful. Um, and this example right here is precisely the reason that this move is no longer a good move. Because normally units could move within the area of other units without having to worry about the threat. But what Surge actually does for this list is not give it flank charge against this list. It's not that it can reliably guarantee flank charges. A good player will prevent you from getting those. A good player will position the units in such a way that you will not be able to surge get their flanks. However, what surge does do is force the opponent to play around the fact that you can effectively move sideways and charge, which turns the threat of units that are normally only limited to a front arc, because normally the threat of a cav unit is limited to here. 
and there is no other way for this to generate threat. If you're in this area, this cab unit means nothing. But with Surge, we now effectively have, it's not a true 360 threat because it's limited past these arcs. In the front, the, sur the threat range is 16 inches. So we have this arc here. This is the 16 inch threat range of the rev cab to the front. But on the flanks, we have effectively at least what I would safely say is a nine inch threat range to either side because they can move eight inches and then surge one. And a very short, I would say, the safe number is a single inch, but for the sake of argument, we'll say two in a gamble situation, a two inch threat radiance behind them. So you can't just sneak behind them and try to play games. This turns these pieces into far more threatening pieces. Um, this is the equivalent of making your pawns turn into bishops just by having this ability available. You won't find that you're running across the board, sneaking behind lines and hitting units in the backfield like the enemy's rooks, but you do at least have the option to, and your opponent has to play around that. Um, more often than not, your pieces are still going to function like pawns, it's just that they threaten things like bishops. So, um, but it is worth noting that that is the real power behind Surge, is just the extra threat generation. And I think a lot of new players don't take that in mind when they're looking at uh, units like skeletons or uh, zombies or other things that normally may not hit that hard, but then can. Um, and it used to be, and I, I will go ahead and put this out there, that it used to be that surgeable units had a limitation on how good their attacks were. They could only hit on fours at best. There was zero units in the game that had a a melee of three plus that could also be surged. That was removed in third edition, and I actually think that that was bad for the design of surge because the limitation of surge was that your units by default were never going to be melee efficient, so you either had to take advantage of the flanks or you had to take advantage of the positioning and the threat generated from this ability. Now we have units that can both A, put out damage, and B, also be threatening in this position, and the only downside is that they are slower on average because they cannot move at the double. Um, that's a conversation for Surge and a discussion on Surge that can be had later. Um, where I can go into more detail about the, the threat of Surge and how it's generated and how much you need um, or what are good Surge moves, bad Surge moves, um, and stuff like that. But for now, this is mostly just to kind of convey threat. Hopefully this has made a lot more sense than the last one. This is a lot, more, lot less rambly, a lot more showcasing like how to project threat, how to play around threat. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's going to wrap it up, guys. So if you enjoyed this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Throw something down below. If there's a topic you'd like me to cover, leave it in the comments so I can take a look at it and see what I can do. Uh, other than that, you all have a fantastic rest of your day and stay safe out there.